Hey, how's it going? I'm going to be taking through the OCR June 2016 exam paper for computing. So, uh, before we begin, I always say this, but make sure you do this paper if you haven't already. You're fortunate in the sense that it's near the end of this course, 2017 is the final year that this course is going to be taken, and it means you've got tons of exam papers to practice. So, uh, do as many as you can. They're so useful uh, practicing past papers for every subject, not just for computing. So, you know, it's the thing I used to hate doing most when I was revising because you have to sit undistracted for an hour and a half. You've got to turn your phone off, don't listen to music, don't watch TV, just work for an hour and a half and, you know, you'll be enjoying it in the summer because you've worked hard. So, uh, you know, go through the paper, mark it and compare it to these grey boundaries. Uh, you can just Google this. I'm sure you know where to find this document. But this is the, uh, this is the bit you really want to be looking at. Uh, the raw marks for this component and you can compare them compare the mark you got when you did this to what people got last year when we actually sat this paper and this will give you a rough estimate of what it'll be like this summer although grade boundaries do always fluctuate so never bank on a grade boundary being the same because examiners will always find a way to change them if they can so uh, let's just have a look at the front page in case you are unfamiliar with it so it's an hour and a half this paper uh, you are allowed calculators which is good to know um, and it's got to be in black ink but I'm sure that's the same for every subject so that's uh, not a big deal uh, also it's out of 80 marks so that's about all you need to know okay so the first question is about character set and we've got to describe what's meant by character set for one mark so a nice gentle introduction to this paper ideally so a character set is just a list of symbols that uh, the computer can understand. It's a set of characters, but we can't really write that. So uh, let's say it's uh, the symbols a computer can use. Uh, it's probably better than understand a computer can use. Um, and we're gonna look at uh, two representations, ASCII and Unicode, or two individual character sets. So that would get us a one mark, nice and simple. Uh, for BI, we're given a bit of context about the emoji character set, or, uh, well, yeah, um, and we're given a character code for the little monkey emoji here in hexadecimal. And we're going to convert the hexadecimal number to binary and the first three digits to be done for us. This should be really easy revision, to be honest. Um, at this stage, you should really be able to do this, um, but it's, it's really easy to learn, so it's not a huge deal. So first of all, we have four. We've got to convert nice and simple because it's the same as in deanery. Uh, the first in hexadecimal, uh, as you should know, the first, uh, oh, that's going off the screen, zero to nine are shared with deanery. So uh, four is just going to be zero, one, zero, zero in binary. Uh, if you want to really uh, see why, we have our column headings of this, and basically we're saying we've got four, a lot of one, so four. Uh, a is a little bit tricky because we have kind of a two-step process because A is not a deanery number, as you can see. So A corresponds to 10 in base 10. So we're really converting 10 to uh, binary. I always do this kind of two-step process. So 10 in binary is going to be, the process would be, again, how many times would 8 go into 10? It goes in once. We write down a 1. How many times does 4 go into the remainder, which is 2, uh, 0, and we have 2 and then 0. I don't know if that made sense, so let me just write my columns again. And just demonstrate this. Um, if you don't understand this, I've got videos on it, and there's probably thousands of videos on YouTube about this. So we've got one lot of eight and one lot of two, which total up to ten. So this is our kind of successful conversion. So the bit in orange is our answer. Uh, for II, we have a two marker. Uh, we've got to say why. We've got to explain why uh, mobile phones that can send emoji would use Unicode instead of ASCII as their character set. So the kind of premise here is. But you, so ASCII is the oldest character set and it only stores, uh, it only uses uh, seven bits per character, which doesn't give us much space, whereas Unicode uses, I think, uh, I, might, I might have to check this, but 16 bits minimum is what I want to say. There are different versions of Unicode which use increasing number of bits, but essentially the crux of it is that Unicode uses more bits per character, so it can represent more characters. ASCII can barely represent the English language, let alone you know, little monkey emojis. So uh, our first point would be that uh, ASCII hasn't got enough space to store emoji. And we need to, you always want to be, I mean, a good exam technique uh, to mention early on is Q 
keeping an eye on how many marks the question is worth because you're not going to get two marks of this little one bullet point really. This will be our first mark, um, but we need to obviously write in our second mark, which is really the, ex ex uh, the explanation bit. So um, we can say that the reason this is is because Unicode uses 16 bits per character instead of uh, ASCII 7 bits per character. Uh, 7 bits per character, I'm quite involved to write this out, uh, whereas Unicode uses, I'm going to say 16, but there are, like I say, different versions. Those uh, Unicode uses 16. Also, you do have extended ASCII, which has 8 bits, um, but I'm sure the example wouldn't mind you putting either 7 or 8 bits, and likewise with Unicode, there's not one set number, there's not one set version. Only on the second question, we've already got a six marker, so a quality of written communication one. So you've got to be very careful with your, you know, spelling, grammar, uh, using proper terms, and so on. You can't just do bullet points if you only get full marks. You need to write it out in proper sentences. But uh, I'm sure every exam has this component. So um, we're told that Lauren is a computing teacher. She's building a website for her class where they can share ideas, send each other programs, and discuss computing concepts. They'll have individual accounts. Uh, discuss the ethical and legal issues. This is quite a common um, uh, kind of way that OCR will approach these longer mark ones, where they set up kind of two things for you to talk about. Because often it's hard to you know waffle and stretch out just one one thing. Uh, so you know you won't get um, you're not going to get a question exactly like this, but often you'll have to talk about ethical and legal issues in a different you know different format, like a full marker maybe. It's a very common uh, question for GCC computing. So um, I'm not going to write this out because I think I might lose all to live on this graphics tablet. But uh, we can talk about two components. So basically, if it does mention two parts to it, uh, you've got to address both if you want to get six marks. Let's assume you're going for six marks for this question. Um, you can't just address one, you have to address both. The mark scheme almost always uh, says for top, for top marks, you basically have to address both. Um, so for a little context bit, uh, we'll give you a few pointers usually. Often these questions are more, I'm reluctant to say it, but often a little bit of common sense. Uh, you know, it's difficult to learn and um, teach for these questions. So uh, a couple of issues. First of, all, first of all, let's do ethical first. So I guess ethical, the first one I can kind of think of is they're sending each other programs and hopefully you know what plagiarism is. Uh, it, I'm sure when you've done your coursework it's been talked about, you can't send each other programs. So you've got to be a little bit careful with that. That's more of an ethical issue than a legal issue. Although legal, um, we can maybe talk about, let's do legal here. Uh, we can maybe talk about copyright. Um, that might apply if, because copyright might belong to the students. Ethical, so what did I say? Uh, plagiarism. Uh, so I'm kind of approaching this like I was going to do a plan. I would maybe be tempted to drop, jot down a couple of ideas, but I wouldn't do a proper plan like this. This is more in uh, an alternative to me writing this out. So uh, another ethical issue might be like um, so cyberbullying, maybe. And again, that could be uh, legal, but um, you know, if they're going to share ideas. And there's kind of like this discussion forum, perhaps that could be cyberbullying. You've got to kind of be thinking, you know, what will the exam board want you to be talking about? And this is kind of exactly the stuff. Also, you might have heard of something called the Data Protection Act, so the DPA. It's not technically on a course, I don't think. I sometimes get mixed up between the different exam boards because it's on Edexcels, definitely. But I don't think it's on OCR, but I'm sure you would have heard of it, perhaps. And, you know, maybe the teachers talked about it as well because it's quite an important law. But basically, it's about storing data. So you've got to protect data. You've got to do things like um, if someone wants their data removed, you've got to let them, things like that. Um, so so, so um, let's just take a step back and say this is six marks. So it doesn't, you don't need six distinct points, but I'd be tempted to go for kind of three points each just to get all the bases covered. This is always marked in quite a holistic way, meaning that they don't, they're not looking for bullet points, they're looking for kind of like a general uh, good answer. But I'd always be tempted to kind of um, go like a bullet point per mark, even though you're not writing out in bullet points, obviously. Um, so what else? Uh, ethical issues like parents' permission. Possibly when you're younger, your school would uh, write to uh, 
um, your parents asking for permission for things like this, I perhaps. Uh, otherwise, legal issues. Um, bit of a continuation to Data Protection Act, but could be something like you know keeping data secure. You're dealing with, um, presumably, like a secondary school class. You could be quite careful with private data. You can't just share people's names publicly. It's got to be, you know, password protected. It kind of mentions it here. So uh, this is a kind of idea. This is maybe what I'd be thinking of writing about if I was to do. This. I wouldn't say you literally need three points each to kind of total up to six points, but I'd be tempted to kind of go this way if you could think of six. It's sometimes hard to think of lots of points for these questions. They can be quite awkward to write for, uh, to answer, but um, it, it's more of a general answer. So if it, it doesn't really allow you here uh, to use technical terms, maybe the data protection app would count. Maybe if you were saying like a firewall for this point here, cyberbullying is sort of a yeah, technical term, I don't know. Uh, the general point of this question is uh, just make sure everything's perfect in the way you're writing and trying to come up with as many ideas as possible and make sure you relate it to the context if they give you a context. Alright, question three is on databases. So we're told that Charlotte's got a website which stores details about movies and it's got three tables in this database, film, user and rating. They've got, they've got you know, a few fields. A field is another word for column, by the way. And uh, we have some of the data for the table, uh, for rating table even. And we have to explain why film ID has been included in the rating table. So uh, this is for three marks. So again, uh, if we continue our kind of theme, uh, we're going to look for three distinct points here. So um, first thing we can see is film ID is here in rating. I'm basically asked why it's there. So we can see that film ID also appears in film. So it appears in another table, and it's kind of a giveaway that this is the primary key in uh, it's a primary key of film, and a key field is a a way of uniquely identifying um, a race. So you can see that rating ID is unique, and so is film ID, as in the numbers, the, the, yeah, the numbers and letters are unique, and because it's a primary key in another table, and it's included in a different table. So let me rephrase that. So because film ID is a primary key in the film table and it exists in the rating table, this means it's a foreign key. So that would be our first point. Um, so uh, film ID is a foreign key. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it's not really relevant, but a rating ID would be the primary key for the rating table. Um, but we can say for our second point that it's, so film ID is the primary key in the film table. Uh, I wanted to kind of do some separate points, this is a bit silly, but it is primary key of the film table. And so it's there to kind of forge this relationship, that's where relational comes from in relational databases, to form this relationship to link to the other table um, and so that would be our third point so uh, so it's, it's, you know explain why it's there um, in order to relate tables so um, I guess in this context um, it's to connect for ratings to a film basically they're not much use of their own, really. They have to be connected to a film. 4.5 on its own isn't really relevant unless it's connected to uh, you know, the film title. So that's why it's there, really. But this would get us our free marks. Part B is asking us to explain why it's a good idea to separate the data from the applications that use the database for two marks. So this is talking about um, program data independence, which you achieve from using a DBMS, which is a database management system. And so the kind of idea here is you have your database here <laughs> and um, you have different applications trying to access this database and you want separation because you don't want all of them accessing the same data at the same time this is going to be a nightmare for the integrity of the data you don't want just any application to change the data so you have a DBMS which is just this um, this uh, software that can control access to it and it goes through the DBMS and the DBMS can query the database on its own. So you have this separation of data from the database, uh, between the database and our applications which is what this is asking about but it's not really asking 
uh, what I've just explained. That just gives a bit of uh, explanation to it. But we're, we're told to explain why it's a good idea. So why would you want to do this? Well, I'd say the most obvious one is the separation allows you to limit what the applications can access. So you don't want, um, say if you've got a database for a school, you don't want the students to access the same data that the teachers can access. So the DBMS can help you to limit uh, certain uh, people, you know, enforce permissions, and you can only really do this for having had an element of separation. So uh, let me zoom in and say it allows you to limit access. If the applications and the data are kind of intrinsically linked, you can't really, you need the separation in order to do this. A um, second point would be that you can change either the data or the applications without affecting the other. If you have a separation, you're not directly causing um, the other half to change if you change an application or change the data. So that the separation means they are independent. So yeah, the database can be changed without affecting the applications and vice versa. So the applications can be changed without affecting the database. So that, again to reiterate, the separation means they're not linked so intrinsically. And that would be two points for two marks. C is a slightly bizarre question, but it is a really good test of your understanding of the elements of a database. So we're told to give one example of a record that can be stored in the user table. So a record is another word for a row. Um, record's kind of more of a technical term. In the same way that a field is another word for a column, um, you know, they're synonyms in that sense. So what we have to do, we have to give like a literal example of an entire row for uh, the user table. So the user table is this one here and so basically we have to give an example for each of these fields so a complete row not just one one bit of data a record is an entire row for a field so we have to give a user id a first name a surname a date of birth so you know you can literally put anything here so um let me just let's just copy one of it let's just uh so an id could be like uh John 1, and then what's the next one? We have uh, first name, surname, date of birth. So first name would be John Smith, uh, 5th of March, 85. So that would be an example of a record. The data doesn't actually matter. It's just you have a bit of data for each of the fields. That's what it's looking for. Part D is about queries to the database, so like a question posed to the database. And we have to list the rating IDs uh, of the ratings that we selected from the extract stone. So uh, this is our query. The rating is going to be less than two, not less than or equal to, just less than two. So one or zero. And the user ID is going to be Jade01. So it's going to be the ratings table because it kind of says. And so first of all, rating is going to be less than two. So you can immediately cross out 4.5 and two is not less than two so we can cross that out as well so it's going to be one of these two and we're looking for jade zero one as the user id and so the rating id that will get returned is zero zero two one five okay for the second part we have to kind of do the opposite we have to actually write the criteria for a query this time and this one's going to select all the films produced in the year 2015 in the category comedy so um the, the two fields we're kind of looking at are category and i've messed that up but year as well um, and we don't, well, let's just have a look. Let's just make sure that year is an actual field, first of all. And so is category, yeah, they're both proper fields, so that's fine. I mean, this is this is a really easy free mark. So basically, we're just doing this again. So um, the year has got to be 2015, and, um, and uh, the category is going to be comedy. And that is literally it. Um, yeah, uh, a really easy three marks there. All right, I just checked for mark scheme because that seemed far too easy, uh, and it, it is easy. Um, it did say mark scheme. This has got to be in quotes because this is a string, and so strings always have quotes. Year 20, 2015 doesn't have to because it's a number. It wouldn't matter if you put quotes there, um, but comedy's got to have quotes because it's a string. Anyway, you're kind of copying from here, so you shouldn't really miss that. So we've got a lot of information for question four. We're told that Joseph is an author and a programmer, and to need to estimate how many pages his book will have. Uh, we're given some information, which we can probably ignore for now, uh, and it uses this algorithm to estimate the number of pages. 
but it does not give the correct result, which is a shame. So the first bit is, uh, we'll go back to this, I'm sure. Uh, the first part is to state whether this uses selection, sequence, or iteration, so the three kind of basic constructs. Well, uh, it's a very simple program. It's just flowing. That's, <laughs> I was meant to be straight. It's just flowing. Uh, it's not doing any branching. It's not doing any loops. It's just sequence, so kind of the simplest construct. B says that the third line defines a constant, described as meant by a constant for two marks. Again, I'm really driving this point home, but this is going to be kind of two distinct points, really. So a constant is a, um, well, first of all, let's just say a common misconception is that a constant is a variable that can't change. Well, it's not a variable because it's a constant, so that's a bad definition. So a constant is like a variable in a sense, but it's also a, a uh, location in memory. So a constant just references a memory location and the contents at that memory location cannot be changed during execution. Uh, that's <laughs> going to not work. So uh, a location in memory uh, of which the contents cannot be changed. So the two key points of this are location in memory and cannot be changed. That's the two marks uh, there. Right. Part C, we have a error in line 5 of the algorithm. Write a corrected line of code to replace the fifth line. Right, to answer this, we do have to kind of go back and look at this context, which I skipped over earlier. So we're told, first of all, that it's line 5, which is the issue. And it says it um, doesn't give the correct result, which means this is a logic error. Um, the syntax is fine. It just doesn't do what he wants it to do. Um, so it literally will work, but it just doesn't do um, what he intends. So the key to answering this question, um, unless you can work it out on your own, is to read this little bit here. So basically it tells us that uh, the number of pages is estimated by dividing the number of words by 300. This is our constant here. Uh, then you ignore the decimal part of the division, which is using a round down function, which it kind of explains here. I don't know if that's going to be used in a future question. Uh, we then add the number of chapters to this total. And this is the key bit. Uh, because what it's doing in line 5 is it's adding number of chapters to number of pages, which is great, but it's not using the previous total because it's using number of words, which isn't really relevant to what it's trying to do. Number of words is just the input here. Um, so we can cross out number of words, and what it's actually what you need to write is pages instead because it's using this is this line saying we're using uh, the new value of number of pages is the old value plus number of chapters, which is exactly what this line is telling us to, adding to this total. And um, by this total, it means basically the line here. So um, this is just a mistake, uh, the logic error, and we need to write this line out. So this is the line we want. Uh, as I say, just replace words with pages, and that's our one mark. For part D, we need to identify the most appropriate data type for the following variable for number of words one. Uh, give a reason for your choice. So. The number of words is going to be, well, it's a number, so it's either going to be a float or an integer. And you can't have half a word, so it's going to be an integer. An integer is a whole number, by the way. A float would be like a decimal. But you can't have like 0.5 of a word, or you would hope not. So integer is definitely the most appropriate uh, data type. You know, there's not really another option, unfortunately. Uh, well, it's probably a good thing, actually. But the reason would be, um, you know, yeah, you can't have half a word, or let's say a fraction of a word. Part E is a very similar question. We don't have to give a reason this time, but we have to suggest or state uh, the most probable data type for two new variables, the name of the book and the price of the book. So the name is just going to be a string. Wow, uh, that's gone well. Uh, it's going to be a string, and the price is going to be a float or a real. Those are kind of the two words used to describe this, or whatever it's called in your language, like it might be double or whatever. Um, so that would get you your two marks. Joseph is using an IDE to produce a program, and it says one tool that an IDE has is a translator, which actually is not something I would immediately think as being a tool for an IDE, but it is, so fair play to exam board for mentioning that. If you get a question like this in your exam that doesn't, obviously it won't be written like this exactly, uh, this could be an option for you. Uh, talk about the fact that you have translators. If you didn't have an IDE, if you're just writing in like Notepad, uh, you'd, have to, you'd have to use a command line and have to basically tie in your translator to yourself. So the fact that an ID has this is really so an ID in case um, you don't know is something like Eclipse, which is a really popular one. Uh, that's what I use Eclipse. Uh, also could be well, it could be slightly more simple like Idle for Python. Uh, anything really, anything other than you know 
like a notepad uh, would be an IDE. So we have to describe two additional tools uh, that Joseph could use. So the first tool you often have, well, one thing that's really useful, especially for beginners, is the fact that you have this kind of text editor, um, quite like, you know, usually a relatively advanced text editor. And it will do things like uh, indent for you, highlight keywords often. So, you know, a, uh, a data type might be in purple or, well, anything really. Um, so that's really useful. And also, like I say, it will do things like indents and, uh, yeah. So uh, to describe this, we can say it allows source code to be easily changed. Um, and will highlight keywords and indent, etc. <laughs> Not the greatest uh, sentence, but it does the job. So the second most obvious tool to me would be a debugger. And by the way, these aren't the only two options. Uh, but the, the most, the second most obvious would be the fact that you usually have like a debugger um, in an ID or a good ID. Uh, thing about, I'm not sure Python's default one idle does, but Eclipse definitely does. Maybe one you've used does as well. Things like um, breakpoints, being able to trace your variables using uh, a watcher tool, things like that. So uh, let's put debugger and yeah. So describe it. We can say. Um, helps detect errors like it might be actually related to the text editor often it will kind of auto detect syntax errors and highlight from red for example helps detect errors using tools like breakpoints and that should be sufficient like i said there are other options those are the first two i thought of and you can see look at mark scheme that here's the text editor and here's the debugger kind of bit here it kind of talks about yeah breakpoints and watches uh, in a separate place but it would still be fine uh, so other ones it says having runtime environments useful uh, you can kind of instead yeah it makes it a lot easier you don't have to actually create an executable um, things like versioning tools is not as obvious and that's about it but uh, those are just other options G is another for marker and it's asking us about compilers and interpreters and how Joseph could make use of these two different translators when producing his program. So it's four marks and it's obviously going to split up two for each section for the compiler and interpreter. So the difference is uh, both translators both translate from high level to low level. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, from high level to low level um, and they do it in different ways. So the compiler translates the whole code in one go and creates an executable file, so like a .exe, which you can click and run, and you can distribute it, and so on. Uh, the source code is hidden, so if you're, if you're say, you know, creating some paid software, you don't want people to see the source code. You'd use a compiler uh, because you can't see the source code. Whereas an interpreter uh, translates line by line instead of doing the whole thing, and so you need to uh, distribute both the source code and the actual interpreter program in order to be able to run the program. So we work in different ways. And uh, suitable for different purposes. So a compiler, um, uh, you so you'd use a compiler to create an executable to uh, distribute it while protecting the source code. We can say that should comfortably get us uh, two marks uh, to distribute uh, while protecting the source code because you know if you double click on a dot exe file, you're not going to see the source code. It's just gonna just gonna execute while protecting source code. In terms of the interpreter, because an interpreter works line by line, um, it means as soon as you get to an error, it will stop uh, translating. So to explain that a bit more, basically, let's say this is code, this little paragraph is code. A compiler will just translate it line by line, and then you can kind of, you have this executable file, then you can execute it. Whereas a interpreter will basically translate this line, run it, translate the next line, run it, translate the next line, run it. And if you have an error in one of these, <laughs> let's symbolize it using our IDE text editor uh, feature, uh, it won't execute it, it will stop. Um, so it's good for testing errors, so that's often why interpreters are used. Uh, and I think that's about it. So can we use to test the program as it works line by line? That's phrased very badly. Uh, yeah, uh, can we use to test the program because it works line by line and so will stop when it reaches an error? And that should get us combined with this bit up here, our full marks.